Glad to be here with you. And let me just, in a, in a statement of uh, frank admiration, express my deep respect for the amount of hard work you have done as a group and as individuals over the past few days, visiting different cities, being briefed in very acute and serious circumstances, uh, bringing that all in, uh, enjoying um, bus trips, which I'm sure are central to your view of what quality of life means, um, showing up here and then working intensely today as you have for the presentations tomorrow. It's, uh, it's awesome to see people of your caliber and background. Uh, you all have very busy lives where you normally are and you come from places which are demanding and the notion that you would be part of this and making your contribution to this, I think, is something that speaks very broadly of your own, not only commitment to broader networks and engagement, but also to the kind of contribution you can each make as individuals relative to moving society ahead on tough and compelling questions which require serious engagement. Now, for those of you who are not Canadian, I should just say a word about the Canadian Senate. It is not an elected body. In fact, one of the preconditions for being in the Senate that you, is that you've run for office several times and been defeated. <laughs> which would be one of the um, compelling attributes that I bring to my role in the Senate. But I was appointed by someone who was a prime minister of another party, which doesn't happen often. In the UK, you have the crossbencher tradition, uh, and you have an allocation of uh, seats in the Lords based on um, a mix of political affiliations, crossbencher affiliations. In our country, not so much. In our country, you are... Uh, you are appointed usually if you share the same political affiliation as the prime minister who happens to be in power at the time. I was appointed by a liberal prime minister. My background in politics is what we used to call progressive conservative, conservative. Uh, the British would call me a wet. Um, at home I'm called a red Tory. O'Brien will say that in Alberta we call him things even worse than that. <laughs> but he'll be very judicious today and diplomatic. Um, and uh, when, I, um, when I got to the Senate, um, which was about eight and a half years ago, um, I had to be reminded of something that I wrote about the Senate when I was a columnist and a political commentator on TV. I used to say that in our country, the Senate is a taskless thanks. <laughs> which every newspaper in Canada remembered when I was appointed. Raised it with me. Um, the challenges that you have been addressing in the last few days and the uh, level of change in global dimension is really, in many ways, unprecedented. When I was a young person back in the 60s and 70s, if your family thought of, in my part of Canada, going to Florida, during the winter, that would have been a very exotic undertaking. And families who thought about coming to Europe or visiting Asia or Africa would have been at a level of economic capacity well above the norm. Um, we now live in a society where uh, student exchanges across the globe are normative. Um, a natural disaster in Thailand can have significant economic and political effects on the west coast of Canada. And where extremism and intolerance on the part of a religious or political organization can cause havoc, suffering, and disaster affecting us all and all our communities because of the remarkable diffusion of diaspora communities in most of our countries. Now more than ever, the efforts of leaders such as yourself who are working to build cross-cultural relationships around the world so as to generate constructive outcomes matters more than ever. Facility with diversity is no longer a wouldn't it be nice managerial or leadership option. It is fundamental and primordial in terms of any business, public policy or geopolitical strategy. Innovation that generates economic activity and progress also creates, if properly channeled, a culture of social license and broader opportunity for more people. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, culture reflects 
amongst other things, a repeated pattern of practice and behavior that embodies a range of recurring beliefs and preferences or disposition. Culture as a collective and individual context can liberate, facilitate, and expand the prospects for individual achievement, communal peace, mutual respect, and common sense. But it does require intrinsic understanding and tolerance. An open mind and a welcoming spirit to be able to see through the eyes of someone whose life experience, values, and history is radically different from yourself is fundamental. It is essential. And to become a leader in a field requiring a global intercultural cooperation requires an open-mindedness and understanding of deep sensitivity. This is true of intercultural, interethnic, internationality realities as it is for understanding the differences in generation, economic status, and gender. Inclusion, colleagues, is not an outcome. It's an instrument for achieving other outcomes. And sometimes we will see processes that are driven towards inclusion as an outcome without actually addressing what that outcome is meant to achieve in the broader context. And when there's a failure of that cultural sensitivity, the impact can be radically horrific. When David Rockefeller inspired the creation of the Trilateral Commission, which I have the privilege of sitting as one of the Canadians involved after World War II, it was because he had concluded with colleagues in Japan and Europe that one of the contributing factors to the horror of World War II was the lack of a cultural affinity and understanding between business, academics, elites, government leaders in Asia, Europe, and North America. It was, of course, not the only factor to produce the horror of World War II. But over 60 million civilians died in a war that was not of their making. So the implications of not addressing the challenge of genuine cultural leadership are serious. I put it to you that the ultimate purpose of leadership is to inspire others to achieve and accomplish their best possible outcome as part of a focused undertaking with clear purpose. Leadership is not an automatic right granted resulting from a promotion or appointment to a position. That may be how it starts. That may be a step in the process. Leadership is most successful when it is earned. When those who look to you for direction and guidance do so out of trust in your competence, your abilities, and recognition, that your decision-making acknowledges and benefits from their input and judgment. And as history shows us, and many have discovered, leadership when imposed and not earned is both temporary, shallow, and results in disastrous consequences. One of the challenges we face often is how do we get governments to do the right thing when they are caught up in their own world sometimes of politics and day-to-day -day struggle. And I would argue that some of what you've been talking about and some of what you've seen in the last few days is fundamental. It is networks of people who are technically acute, who are socially and economically entrepreneurial, who change the political context within which governments have to operate. Governments will not do what's right because someone has suggested that it's appropriate. They will do what's right when the political context indicates it is manageable within the democratic framework that they have to negotiate. Let me give you three examples from my own country, none of which are perfect. There would have been a view about drinking and driving 35 years ago in Canada, which was, it's sort of okay. A couple of beer, a couple of drinks, three or four glasses of wine, not a problem. People would say, if you were my size, God, with your total volume, you can have several glasses of wine, it's never gonna show up on the Richter scale. And then a series of organizations not in government, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, um, uh, physicians, uh, epidemiologists, 
a whole bunch of others began to form networks that lobbied in their own jurisdictions. And it became impossible for government to come up with an answer to the question. How can we allow this carnage on the road to continue? And rules were changed each province because we're a federation, went about it in their own way, in different ways. I remember in my advertising days, we did a series of advertisements on behalf of the Attorney General of Ontario to make the case. We'd have body bags piled up next to a car wreckage. We found out doing research, cultural sensitivity, young people do not think body bags relate to them. Young people believe they're going to live forever. Well, then we had to do a series of other kinds of ads, dads who didn't come home, kids who are attending each other's funerals, hard hitting, but they were necessary. And then we got the beer companies themselves to begin to talk about responsible drinking. And you could see the culture shift, and then government brought in the legislative, statutory, regulatory changes, police increased enforcement, and a series of things that produced a radical decline, people who are found guilty of drunk driving and automobile accidents caused by drunk driving. In fact, now the biggest cause of automobile accidents in my country is texting people who are distracted. And so we're seeing now a lobby for new legislation around distracted driving with greater penalties. Similarly, 30 years ago, when people said, you know, seat belts would be one heck of a good idea in Canada, the, the, the car company said, what are you, crazy? Well, who has the money for seat belts? We're gonna, this is gonna add $1,500 to the cost of a car. You can't do that. It's, the, it's, it's undue government regulation. And then the very same people who engaged on the other circumstance, including a whole bunch of parents, driver ed people, and others, trauma surgeons, all engaged to make the case that we cannot let this carnage continue. The only group who has suffered, quite frankly, through seatbelt legislation in my country are the people who do um, kidney and other kinds of transplants because less people are dying with head injuries. And of course, a young driver with a head injury is a great source of organs to be used to save the lives of other people. And that has produced some sourcing issues, but all of us believe that's a step in the right direction. And let me say a word about smoking. If somebody had said to me 20 years ago, you'd be not able to smoke walking through a downtown park. You could not sit outside a tavern, outside a tavern, let alone in the tavern, and have a cigarette or smoke a pipe while you're having a pint, I would say you're completely wacko. Nevertheless, that has been the trend, the statutory and legislative trend, because not so much of the harm that you do yourself if you're smoking, but because of the second-hand smoke issue for the employees of the bar. And under our safe labor rules, advocates for a safe working place could make the case that it's not about the person who's smoking, it's about the people who, to make a living, have to ingest and inhale that stuff on an ongoing basis. So it was a mix of technical work and acute lobbying that changed the political context. And part of our challenge around issues like climate change and other as aspects of sustainability is how do we actually change the political context in a way that makes the obvious choice a bit more available to our political class. The um, networks that are formed by entrepreneurs, scientists, leaders, technology stars, um, in all aspects of social and economic engagement, usually outstrip what government can do. Usually move much faster than, engage more intensely than government can. And I think one of our challenges is to how, is how we narrow that gap so that governments are not always so far behind that people believe they are in fact disengaged from reality on the ground. In my role as Canada's envoy to the Commonwealth over the past three years, I met with counterparts and government officials and leaders in business and civil society and academics and 
Commonwealth representatives in their own countries and had the privilege of doing so in the UK and India and Singapore and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and Malaysia and in uh, um, Malta and South Africa and Tanzania and Kenya and Trinidad and Barbados and Australia. And while we had different histories and different backgrounds and different cultural biases, the truth of the matter is that without regard to economic rank or social status or language barriers or etiquette or history, we did come away with a common view. And the common view was there was only potential relevance to our day-to-day -day lives as one of the 2.4 billion citizens in the Commonwealth if the Commonwealth itself was a force for good promoting the partnership between democracy and development and promoting human rights, rule of law, and independent judiciary, the framework within which people can go about their lives, unintimidated by the state and unimpacted by the forces of darkness that frankly exist in all our societies. In my experience, which just so you know, I was a student government leader, a national party vice president, chief of staff to a provincial premier and a Canadian prime minister, cabinet secretary on constitutional affairs, uh, negotiator for that on Ontario, a CEO of a hundred million dollar company, a vice chair of an industry association which was the advertising industry in Canada. As a senator, I have come to some conclusions on the subject of leadership which I'm going to share very briefly with you. Leaders cannot inspire or motivate unless they truly understand the history, disposition, aspirations and culture of those with whom they work. And this is a mix both of acute technical brief, just as you would require a technical brief for any undertaking you needed to embrace, and emotional intelligence. The two together are, in my judgment, fundamental to making any progress. Real results only come about when participants feel that who they are and what they believe in is being respected and is welcomed and considered in deliberations not only of the mission description but of what actually constitutes success. The notion that a leader defines success without actually getting a broad view from the whole network as to what that success means I think is potentially, if I may say so, very narrow. The common eminent persons group consisted of ten people from the Commonwealth. Two from Africa, two from the Caribbean, and one each from Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, Malaysia, Vanuatu, and Pakistan. The ages of the members ranged from 24 to 73. One of our members was gay. One of our members paused to pray five times a day during our deliberations. At the beginning of the process, there was no unity of purpose at all. At the end of the process, our final report was signed off unanimously. This exercise proved that such a diverse cross-cultural, cross-generational group could, with understanding, respect, and openness, achieve broad goals while still affording the scope for different cultural frames and histories. Common cause, congenial engagement, cross-cultural competence, and highly tuned emotional intelligence in terms of leadership are the vital pathways to make progress. Culture and economics are not sealed off from each other and be careful of those folks who suggest otherwise. Leading is about being real, being aware of your surroundings and respectful of those around you while recognizing that what motivates and accommodates different people and cultures. While measuring profitability is a vital sign of successful private sector leadership and gaining passage of important legislation or gaining re-election may be a sign of governance success. The truth is that both require enabling social licenses which come from societies, markets, workforces and communities that believe they count in the articulation of what success means and how it is achieved. The Commonwealth 
as a soft power, multi-ethnic, multi-faith, and broadly diverse cultural mix has the leadership potential to take a global role in bringing about more of this respect and understanding in its member countries and especially amongst its young people. The Commonwealth Secretariat and Commonwealth members have a chance to take the work that we did, the EPG report, largely approved by the government leaders in Perth in 2011, and look at some new dynamic institutions which would serve to advance the goals that we share. A Commonwealth University, a Commonwealth Youth and Environmental Corps, a Commonwealth Democracy Promotion Unit, a Commonwealth Human Rights Commission. These are very achievable, as would be a Commonwealth Innovation and Incubation Center. Organizations, companies, and networks must prove their worth on an ongoing basis. Organizations which take time from leaders, seek to survive on pooled contributions, must be purpose-driven. Existing just to exist is no longer enough, just as it is not enough for private, corporate, civil, government, and educational institutions represented by all of you in this room. Global leadership must embrace and include cultural intelligence and all that it entails. All the hinges of social stability and measured economic progress in every Commonwealth country and throughout the world beyond the Commonwealth family revolve around the same policy and macroeconomic exigencies which act as what we would call in Canada, condition préalable, solid monetary policy, the rule of law, respect for diversity, human rights, an independent judiciary, competent education, clear democratic accountabilities. These are fundamental. Let me give you three examples in closing, and then I'll sit down and take questions, personal attacks, whatever, whatever makes you feel good at this part of the day. In the mid-1970s in Canada, senior citizens were largely, in large measure, living in poverty, believe it or not. In the mid-1970s, most of our senior citizens were women. The men had passed away. They did not have substantial pensions or inheritances. And in Ontario alone, 35% of all seniors were living in poverty. There was a debate in our legislature and the two opposition parties brought in a motion to reduce the salary of the deputy minister and the minister not by a dollar, but to a dollar. That got the bureaucrats' interest up. I was 25 years old, legislative assistant to the premier. Now, when you're 25, you know everything, right? There's no, no mystery in the world. You have all the answers to every possible problem. And the deputy minister, a very distinguished social scientist, came around the corner and said, what are you going to do about my salary? I said, we're not going to have an election on your salary. We're in a minority government. We're not going to go to the people on your salary. Let's find out what's really going on. And we found out that the opposition parties took the view that letting people, senior citizens, buy cat food and dog food to add protein to their diet was simply unacceptable. Three weeks later, one of the most conservative finance ministers in Canadian Ontario history, Darcy McHugh, pinstripe suit, Bank of Montreal tie, Toronto Club cufflinks, the whole schmear, got up and announced the guaranteed annual income supplement for senior citizens. No new forms to fill out. Just fill out your tax form like you always do. If you fell beneath a certain level, you'd be automatically topped up to the poverty line. Not one new public servant had to be hired. Two years, the rate of poverty fell from 35% to 3%. And when the senior citizens took that extra money because they couldn't afford to save it, spent it, rents, various other things, the tax system caught a lot of it and brought it back. So it ended up being a wash but had a huge impact, it spread across the country, we now have a national program, but that was because culturally, one party was prepared to listen to another and try to figure out what it is they really needed or wanted. Two very brief final stories, and they relate a little bit to um, my country's military. We're not a uh, deeply military country, but when called upon, we do our best. I was in Bosnia, 
visiting with our Canadian troops who had an area of responsibility near Darvar. And uh, we were out on patrol. There were two armored vehicles together. There had been someone arrested for potential war crimes, so the security level was higher. The commanding officer was a master corporal from the fort, from the um, Lord Strathcona horse in a place called Edmonton. She was a very competent, able reservist, which means she had a regular job, but she signed up as a reservist to be part of the process. We're driving through an area, and we come to an area of thatched homes, not in great shape. Under the Dayton Peace Accords, people had been told they could go back to where they came from throughout the territory to live out their lives, and this thatched group of houses had a group of Serbian women, mostly in their 70s, who would basically come home to their own village to die amongst their own friends and relatives. The local government, which was not Serbian, had said $1,800 a house to reconnect electricity. Might as well have been $18 million for those people. So we arrive in the area, and I'm, there are a few, a few of us academics who were part of this exercise from the, de the Defense and Security Forum. We got our ha ha helmets on and our flak jackets and all the rest, and we pull into this area, and all the old women come out, older women come out of their homes to see us. And um, very friendly, very keen on seeing us, not the sort of thing NATO soldiers were necessarily used to. And then I realized why. The master corporal then said, heavy weapons bay. And our people reached down into the heavy weapons bays and the armored personnel carriers and they took out bags of bread, bags of potatoes, bags of fruit. We may not have been the best armed of the forces in Bosnia at that time, but our soldiers ate well. Our kitchens were the best. And there was more than we needed. And it just struck those Canadian soldiers, as I'm sure it would have struck soldiers from many of the countries here today, that the humane thing to do was to share that with people who were having great difficulty surviving. And because there was no electricity, their homes were very cold. One of the people invited us in for a quick cup of tea, and we went in, and there was a cheminée in the corner, a glow with heat and light. And I found out that Canadian and other NATO soldiers had gone to um, the capital city in Croatia and bought cheminées themselves with their own money on their own time and came to install them in those people's homes so they could have a little bit of humanity. Needless to say, those were people who trusted NATO soldiers and those Canadian soldiers trusted them. And the information and insight and intelligence which flowed back and forth was of huge value to security in the region overall. One final story, then I'm done. Afghanistan, Kandahar province, a forward NATO Canadian base. Um, I am there about 18 months ago being briefed. A young lieutenant colonel from the Vanderzeem Royals Canada, the 22nd Regiment, Royal 22nd, a very famed Quebec regiment, is in charge. And he says, before we do a detailed briefing on operations and all that other military stuff, I want you to go up the observation tower and scan the horizon with me and see the context which we face. So up we went, the Minister of Defense was with me, the Chief of the Defense Staff was with me, or more appropriately, I was with them. And, um, as we're scanning the horizon, there's a two-story squat building about a mile and a half beyond where we are. And it's flying an Afghan flag, and it's flying a Canadian flag. So I asked the obvious question, what do they do there? And the Lieutenant Colonel said, well, it used to be Taliban headquarters. That's where they brought people to be shot, hung, tortured, and otherwise addressed. If they, went, if they went afoul of the Taliban diktat for the area. And I said, what's it now? He said, it's a girls' school. That's the kind of thinking out of the box that makes it appropriate for a military not only to think about how you fire guns, 
and how you go into a defensive posture and how you deal with all the accoutrements and kit of war, but more importantly, how you deal with people and treat them as human beings. On the assumption that the more we're able to do of that, the more progress we can make. And you don't have to think about any particular country, but we can think of many countries across the world where the hinges that address the doors that open for people have not been oiled and greased. They are rusty, they are clangy, and doors are closing on people, young people looking for work, all through the Commonwealth. The biggest single problem is people under the age of 35 who have nothing to do. And when there's violence in communities after contested elections, the people in the streets are the young people with small arms, machetes, whatever, who actually have no other place to be. That is where the economic, social, and political challenges of leadership actually come together. And that's the task that we face. Let me say that I'm honored to be here today, this evening, to listen to you on your project proposals tomorrow. And more importantly, I am grateful that as you build your own networks, both in your own countries, across this room, you will be better than the generations who have come before at putting together intercultural leadership to shape a better world, one where humanity, civility, and decency has more of a shot.